gospel according to Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. <clears throat> I'd like to begin this morning by sharing, for your listening pleasure, the top ten things that you never hear in church. Again, the top ten things that you never hear in church. Number ten. Hey, it's my turn to sit in the front pew. <laughs> Number nine. Pastor, I was so enthralled with your sermon that I didn't even notice that it went 25 minutes longer than usual. <laughs> Number eight, personally, I find serving on the evangelism committee so much more enjoyable than playing around with golf. <laughs> Number seven, I've decided to give our church the $300 a month I used to pay for cable, phone, and internet. Number six, I volunteered to be the permanent teacher for the junior high Sunday school class. <laughs> Number five, look, I know it's a risk. But if you aren't too worried about botulism, please stay for our potluck after the service. <laughs> Number four, I just love it when we sing hymns I've never heard before. <laughs> Number three, since we're all here 15 minutes early, let's go ahead and start the service. That'll never happen here. Nobody's ever here. <laughs> Seriously, the 8.30 service at 8.29, it's Josh and me and the ushers. <laughs> Number two, the Bible conference is where, Pastor? Las Vegas? Sure, I think there's a hotel called Caesar's Palace with reasonable rates. And number one, the top thing you'll never hear in church, nothing inspires me more or strengthens my commitment than our annual stewardship campaign. Now, I'm glad you found these humorous, and what makes them so funny, of course, is that they are, in fact, things you'll probably never here in church, especially the last one. Nevertheless, despite the obvious and inherent risks, I'd like to preach this morning and next week as well on stewardship, specifically financial stewardship, a topic that both parishioners and pastors tend to avoid like a plague, but a topic that is nevertheless absolutely critical to understanding what it means to be a Christian, to lead a Christian life. It's kind of ironic, actually, for instance, did you know that in the Bible, Jesus offers more wisdom and has more to say about money than any other subject besides the kingdom of God? It's true. In fact, Jesus had more to say about money than he did about love. By one count, 11 of the 39 parables of Jesus, again, as recorded in the New Testament, were concerned with how to handle money and possessions. And overall, approximately 15% of the rest of Jesus' preaching did as well. But stewardship, believe it or not, does not begin with money. No, the starting place is a reality much deeper than that. One of my favorite all-time movies is the 1965 film Shenandoah, starring Jimmy Stewart. Stewart plays a, a Virginia farmer named Charlie Anderson, who's trying to keep his family out of the Civil War. Because he promised his deceased wife that he would raise their children in the Christian faith that was so important to her, besides seeing to it that they made it to church, 
on Sundays, albeit late. Charlie also religiously offers it a table blessing whenever they gather for a family meal. However, his own indifference to such matters of faith is on full display when we then actually hear the prayer he offers. Lord, we cleared this land, he prays. We plowed it, sowed it, and harvested it. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be eating it. We hadn't done it all ourselves. We worked dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel, but we thank you for just the same anyway, Lord, for this food we're about to eat on that. In other words, Charlie Anderson paid lip service at best to God's gracious hand in blessing his family's efforts and even making those efforts possible and productive in the first place. That is, for giving them the fertile land on which to farm, the, the fair weather and sufficient rains necessary for their crops to grow, the, the livestock that provided them with food and other essentials, not to mention their own strength and wherewithal to then harvest and gather nature's bounty. Now, of course, they were certainly dedicated and hardworking, but that's not the point. Whether Charlie Anderson was willing to concede it or not, or to believe it or not, it was God who was the one behind all of their accomplishments and success. Well, even though things are going pretty well for the Andersons as the movie opens, despite the war raging all around them, it's not too long before the events take a decided turn for the worse. Throughout the remaining course of the film, you see the Anderson clan experiences one tragedy after another. The, the youngest son is mistaken for a soldier captured and sent to a prisoner of war camp. Another son and his wife are murdered by marauders. And the third son is mistakenly shot and killed by an overzealous sentry. And therefore, when we finally see Charlie Anderson and his family once again gathered at the dinner table, there are four more empty places in addition to the one that had once belonged to his late wife. At first, he begins his prayer ritual just as he always did, but, but this time, we hear his voice start to quiver and break as the awful realization washes over him that he is not in control, that he is not the master of his own destiny. His voice trails off as he finishes the words, if we hadn't done it all ourselves. He stops at that point and walks away, a proud man now broken and stripped of that pride, finally recognizing that he ultimately needs to acknowledge and pray for God's hand in his life. In Shenandoah's final scene, the family arrives for worship, late as usual. And as the service begins, the youngest son, who's been gone for so long and presumed dead, now hobbles into the church, aided by a crutch. And the family turns, first in disbelief and then in unabashed joy, as the pastor then leads them in the hymn, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Did you catch that? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. You see, we all need to acknowledge and pray for God's gracious hand in our lives. Not just the fictional Charlie Anderson. But there's not a single thing that we possess or have achieved in this life that did not come about only because God has blessed our efforts and, and given us the opportunity and wherewithal to bring it all to fruition. In that film chart, Jimmy Stewart's character, Charlie Anderson, was humble. Humbled by the sobering but important realization that God, and only God, is the one in control. Our first reading this morning from the book of Deuteronomy makes that very same point. The people of Israel are reminded in this passage that the promised land that they had come to inhabit, as well as everything the land has provided them, not to mention the prosperity they've enjoyed, has all come, have all come from God's gracious hand. Therefore, do not exalt yourself, they are reminded. Forgetting the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, he made waters to flow for you from Flint Rock and fed you in the wilderness with manna that your ancestors did not know. In other words, remember where you came from and how for those 40 years in the wilderness it was God who took care of you. You did not take care of yourselves. And the obvious question is why? Why remember? And the answer is to humble you. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gained this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. And that's precisely where we need to start when we begin to think about the topic of stewardship. Namely, all that we have and all that we are 
and all that we achieve, all that will ever be, even, comes from God and only God. As we heard the first verses of Psalm 24, put it this way, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. As Gordon MacDonald, the Chancellor of Denver Seminary, has observed, one of the greatest missed teachings in the American church today is the reminder that nothing we have belongs to us. There was a church that was growing so fast that it eventually ran out of parking spaces. And so they went across the street to a store that was closed on Sundays and made a deal with the owner to use the store's parking lot. And the owner said to them, you can use my lot 51 Sundays out of the year, but on the 52nd Sunday, I'm going to chain it off. The church people were confused. Why? They asked. They, we don't understand why you would let us use it for 51 weeks of the year and then chain it off on the 52nd. And the store owner replied, because I never want you to forget that the parking lot belongs to the store and not to the church. In the same way, we're never to forget that our wealth and possessions belong to God, not to us. The late Bishop Edwin Hughes of the Methodist Episcopal Church, the, the forerunner of today's United Methodist Church, once preached a sermon entitled God's Ownership that apparently irritated a rich parishioner of his. And so the wealthy man invited Bishop Hughes to lunch and afterwards walked him through his elaborate gardens and woodlands and farm, including all the barns and outbuildings. Now, he said to Bishop Hughes when the tour was completed, are you going to tell me that all this does not belong to me? Bishop Hughes just smiled and suggested, ask me that same question a hundred years from now. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. As Doug Fannin knows, the American way, of course, is to say, I, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps and, and I worked hard for all I have. But don't we realize it is God who ultimately owns all that we have and all that we are, he asked. So we realize that it's God who gives it. It's God who gives the opportunity and ability to work. And that's the second thing to keep in mind here as we begin to think and talk about the meaning of stewardship. First, God owns it all, right? But second, God gives to each of us the ability and opportunity to work and achieve and prosper. And God's giving is what then inspires our own giving as a response. There's a basic and fundamental concept at work here, one that runs throughout all of Scripture, as a matter of fact, and it's simply this. We give in response to God's giving. Now, the truth of the matter is that God doesn't need our stuff. It's already God's. Rather, it's we who have this basic need to give, to give back to God, in particular by giving to others, especially those less fortunate than we are. Or as God once told the patriarch Abraham in the Old Testament, I bless you to be a blessing. That's how we give back to God. And it goes even deeper than that. As the popular financial coach Dave Ramsey suggests, we have a need to give precisely because we have been created in the image of a giving God. But here's the thing. We can only give to God what God first gave to us. As David Huss points out, we were like that kid who wanted to give his dad a birthday gift. And so he, he went to his father's closet, took a tie off the rack, wrapped it up and presented it to him, saying, Happy birthday, Dad. And when we give to God, says Huss, we take something wonderful that God has given and that belongs to God already. And we give it as though it was ours in the first place. And yet God delights in the gift we present, even though we couldn't give anything if God had not first given it to us. Which leads me to the third point I wanted to make this morning. While our culture places a premium on ownership and the personal accumulation of possessions, the Bible stresses instead the stewardship of God's possessions. According to Dick Towner of the Good Sense Movement, the foundational principle is that, again, we do not own our stuff, but rather God entrusts it to, to us to serve as his trustees. In other words, a steward, that is, the definition of a steward is someone who's been entrusted with the resources of another. In biblical times, a steward, oftentimes a slave, was the one who served as a manager. He had no wealth of his own, but simply managed his master's wealth according to his master's will and direction. And this, of course, stands in stark contrast to our society's focus 
I mean primarily consumers or users rather than managers. In our second reading this morning, we see all three of these strands coming together, namely God's ownership, our need to give as a response to God's giving, and our role as stewards in managing God's resources. In chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking about a collection that he was taking up for the church in Jeru back in Jerusalem, which was experiencing some hard times. And he was encouraging the Christians in Corinth to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but rather cheerfully. Why? Because as Paul writes, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Or to put it another way, a generous God has blessed and enriched us so that we, in turn, can be generous ourselves. Again, like Abraham before us, we are blessed to be a blessing. But keep in mind, all the time, we're using God's stuff. We're just the managers. We're just the, the conduit or channel, or at least we should be, through which God supplies the needs of others and of the world. And as Jesus reminds us in today's gospel, we, we need not worry about our lives, about what we will eat or what we will drink or what we will wear, because God clearly knows that we need all these things, and what's more, God provides them just as surely as he provides for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. Instead of worrying, strive first for the kingdom of God, said Jesus, and all these things will be given to you as well. Sometimes we hear the church being compared to a business. But it's certainly true that, and it's certainly true that we as the church need to be good stewards of, of the buildings and budgets and so forth. But buildings and budgets are not our primary focus as they are and must be in the business world. Turning a profit or pumping up the bottom line is not our goal. Instead, we are in the people business. God has called and gathered us and blessed us with possessions and financial resources, not to be ends in and of themselves, but rather to serve the needs of others. As the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, once observed, the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. Our model and inspiration in all of this, of course, is Jesus himself. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes, For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. We give because God gives. And there's no better example, no greater example of that giving than Jesus, who left his heavenly throne, laid aside the glory that was his, and came to be with us, even giving his life on the cross so that we might be redeemed and reconciled to God. Giving, as Lynn Malone once described it, is simply a response of gratitude for all that God in Christ has given us. We give of ourselves, we give of our resources, we give of our time as a response to God's gift in Christ. One time a, a disgruntled church member said to his pastor, I can't understand this Christianity business. All I ever hear at church is give, give, give. To which the pastor replied, you know, that's about the best description of Christianity I've ever heard. Many of you undoubtedly remember the final scene of Steven Spielberg's film, Schindler's List, where Oscar Schindler, played by Liam Neeson, the German industrialist who saved the lives of more than a thousand Polish Jews during the Holocaust by putting them to work in his munitions factories, has this final moment of clarity in which he realizes that he could have done more, so much more. He considers his remaining wealth and possessions, and he thinks about how they might have been used to save even more lives. His, his Jewish account says, Oscar, there, there's 1,100 people who were alive because of you. Look at them. There'll be generations because of what you did. But Schindler insists, I could have gotten more out. I, I threw away so much money. You have no idea. He, he points to his car. That this car, why did I keep this car? Ten people right there. Ten people. Ten more people. And he rips the Nazi pin from his lapel and says, this pin, two people, this is gold. Two more people, he, he would have given me two for it, at least one, one more person, a person. He begins to sob. I could have gotten one more person, and I didn't. And I didn't. Now, I may not be in as dramatic a fashion, but make no mistake about it, one day each of us, as God's stewards, 
will also have to give an accounting of how we use the money and possessions that we were given to manage here on earth. Just like Oscar Schindler, who was a real person, by the way. Will we have used them only for ourselves? Or have we been good stewards of what God has entrusted to us? How many lives will we have touched and helped and potentially even saved by the way in which we use the wealth that we've been, we have been given to manage on God's behalf? In the final analysis, when considering the question of, of money and finances, these are the only questions that really matter. Amen. Please stand for the hymn of the day.